and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, now we got some questions from you, actually three questions. Uh, let's start answering them, and then we'll start our spiritual word. The first question, why our prayers to the person of the Holy Spirit, much less and every and very rare? compared to praying to the Father or to the Son. We even have more prayers and praises to the Mother, to the Mother of God and Mary and the saints and angels more than the Holy Spirit. Here, any prayer, any prayer, uh, that is the default directed to the Father and the Son by the Holy Spirit. So when we pray, we speak to God the Father. But how can we stand before God the Father? We cannot stand before God the Father except in His Son. We have no acceptance before God the Father except in His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. No one can come to the Father except through me. So, we stand before the Father in the Son. That's why all our prayers, uh, even we add it to the Lord's Prayer in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or we, we end uh, Thanksgiving prayer by the grace, compassion, and love of mankind of your only begotten Son. So all prayers directed to God the Father in the Son. And who is leading us in the prayer? Who is inspiring us? Who is interceding? in prayer for us, as St. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, actually in the Holy, the Holy Spirit. So when we are praying to the Father, we are praying to the Holy Trinity. So that is the default. In some prayers, we address the Son, like in St. Gregory uh, liturgy, we address the Son. Others we address the Holy Spirit, uh, like O Heavenly King the spirit of truth. But I, I don't you to, to think when we pray to the Father, then we are excluding the Son and the Holy Spirit. When we pray to the Son, we are excluding the Father and the Holy Spirit. Or when we pray to the Holy Spirit, we are excluding the Father and the Son. Because the three in one, and our prayer in general, it is Trinitarian prayer. That's why sometimes like in Holy God, Holy Might, Holy Immortal, we say, O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. So when we pray to the Father, we are also praying to the Son and the Holy Spirit. When we pray to the Son, we are praying to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, uh, to, uh, to the Father. And we pray to the Holy Spirit, we are praying to the Father and the Son. It's a Trinitarian prayer in general. But the default to the Father and the Son by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and what we are saying about, uh, and we are praying um, to Saint Mary and the saints, actually, when we address the saints, there are two ways to address them. Either to uh, ask God, and we speak to God, and say, accept our prayer through the intercession of Saint Mary or Archangel Michael, etc. Or we say to St. Mary or Archangel Michael or St. Mark, intercede on our behalf or pray on our behalf. But when we address God the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, it's totally different than when we address the saints. It is not the same. We are addressing the saints to intercede on our behalf, to support our prayer. But when Actually, we cannot say, for example, to St. Mary, forgive us our sins. We say it to God the Father. But to say through the intercession or the prayer and the help and the support of St. Mary, O oh God, forgive us our sins. So, many, most of the prayer pertaining our eternal salvation is addressed to God, not to the saints. But when we address the saints, we address them to support our prayer toward God. Either we say, 
God, please do this for me, for the sake of St. Mary, or I ask St. Mary, please intercede on my behalf before Christ or before God the Father. So it is not the same. Uh, I don't say that the way we address St. Mary is exactly the same way we address uh, God. Definitely not. Second question, say no answer. In the introduction to the creed, what was the necessity of the middle part? Glory be to you, our master. The need for the first part is understood to emphasize the dogma of the Theotokos, and the last part to emphasize the Holy Trinity. But the middle part feels like a prayer, not a creed. And if it is a creed, we certainly don't talk too often in the church of the dogma of Christ, the pride of the apostles, for example. The prayer, the introduction to the creed is, is, a, is actually a prayer that was inserted there. The creed itself is independent of this, this introduction. We have it in our Agbeya, and basically, after we, 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 yes, we talk about the Theotokos and we say she gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ, he came and saved our race. For coming to save our race, then we follow that up with, glory be to our master, our king, cried the Father. We're, we're glorifying him for the work he's done for our salvation. And so it's natural for us, after having said he came and saved our race, to actually ascribe glory to him, to praise him, to glorify him, to worship him, and that's what we do. And then we, we, we proclaim the Holy Trinity, but it really is an independent prayer that was inserted there, and now we have it as the introduction to the creed. When you look at the other churches, they don't have this there before the creed. And so it shows us the creed is there since the fourth century, but this prayer is a Coptic prayer that was placed there, and it is a prayer that we use to kind of introduce the creed for ourselves. On the Arabic translation of our Lord's Prayer, the difference between Khubzana Lazir al Ghad A'atina Liyum and Khubzana Kafafana A'atina Liyum. What exactly is the Lord teaching us in this verse? To depend on Him for our daily bread? Are we asking Him, Khubzana Lazir al Ghad, to give us this day? Are we asking Him to give us today the taste of what we will have? in the age to come, or other meaning. The later Khubzana Kafafna is what we grew up with, and we find in older Agbe. I try to search for the actual interpretations on the web and in the interpretation by Father Tadros Ya'oub, quoting the early church fathers. It seems that the lad later with its literal meaning for our basic material needs and no more, is the more dominant translation and interpretation. Only at the very end does Father Tadros quote St. Jerome referencing a Hebrew translation as being the former Khubzana Rezirat. While all meaning are clearly correct and fit our Orthodox spirit of prayer, what specifically did our Lord teach us in this particular verse? Or what is the most accurate translation and meaning? Or why did our Coptic Church adopt this particular translation in recent time? In order to confuse you more, see <laughs> two more translations. One that is used in English, our daily bread, the Khubzan al Yawmi. Ufi, another one, the Khubzan al Ati. I will point to his name. Khalil al Arab Ashraf al Polish and the Taqul in the Tarjaman Day. The Lord's Prayer was mentioned in Matthew chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 11. All of them in English. Daily bread. For example, if you look at the translation in front of you in English, give us this, this day our daily bread. Khubzana al-Yawmi. Like you are referring to the Ibti, per oik in te rasti. Mif nan al fawl. Per oik in te khubzana. Rasti ma'anaha al ghad. Per oik in te rasti. Fa in nasa al kam hamzan nan al Ibti. بيقولوها في المايك انت راستي مثلان الفقو فترجموها ترجمة الدقيقة بعدها خبزانة الذي للغد خبزانة
خبزنا الذي يدعو اللي ترجم للعربي ترجمها خبزنا كفاف ترجمها العربي خبزنا كفاف تعالوا نشوف لوقا ان لوك شابتر 11 فيرس 3 بالانجليزي give us day by day our day by day الابتي بنقيك اثنين اثنين means uh, الاتي the coming بنقيك اثنين مثلا مثلا يمين يمين يعني كل يوم كان منكم يسمع المتنيح نفت الانبا الريبوليوس لما كان يصلي كان بياخد الترجمة بتاعت انجيل لوه فكان يقول خبزنا الاتي اعطينا اليوم أيقول خبزنا الذي للظهر الآتي أعطينا اليوم لكن العربي برضو خبزنا كفاف عن أعطينا كل يوم الحقيقة انت محتاج يعني لو انت عايز تعرف النص تروح للجريك لأن انجيل لوقة كتب باليوناني وانجيل ما انت كتب باليوناني فلما بصيت في انجيل متى وإنجيل لوقا الكلمة اليونانية ما تغيرتش والكلمة اليونانية يمكن تمشي مع 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 الإنجليزي أكثر اللي هي خبزنا اليومي أو ردي لبرد ويمكن أقدر أقول إن أكثر ترجمة يعني دقيقة في كل الترجمة دي هي خبزنا اليومي لأنها تحمل كل المعاني ما احنا خبزنا اليومي تحمل الطعام الذي للحياة الأبدية زميني ذا بريد زي ما كان نجيل النهاردة بيتكلم don't labor for the bread that purchase but labor for the bread that induce the everlasting life so خبزنا اليومي معناها our daily bread معناها إن the the bread that endures for everlasting life. And if this is speaking about Eucharist or about the Word of God, so we ask God to give us this food that will endure to uh, everlasting life. Even if we are asking about uh, food and and. and drink that we eat and drink as I said in my Arabic sermon today even the, يعني, this prayer should be for the glory of God as I explained when we pray uh, for food so we can take care of our bodies so we can serve the Lord with our bodies as St. Paul said in First Corinthians chapter 10, 31 whatever you do, eating or drinking or anything else do it for the glory of God so when we say بالعربي خبزنا كففنا برضو حتى لو احنا بنتكلم على الأكل والشرب العادي that's for the glory of God لأن احنا لو بنتكلم عن الأكل والشرب فقط كهدف في حد ذاتهم as a goal in itself then we are not following the commandments of the Lord don't labor for the food that perishes بس احنا لما بنطلب ده حتى لو بطلب من أكل والشرب العادي بطلب من أجله علشان الحياة الأبدية عشان أمجد ربنا إذا يصير خبزنا الذي للغد الغد طبعا مش معناه بكرة الغد معناه الظهر الآتي so interesting or في اثنين اثنين means everlasting life so give me today the food the bread whether it's the word of God of Christia to that endures everlasting life or we say daily bread uh, it includes all these meanings uh, together because it's a daily bread I cannot live one day without it without prayer, without the word of God without Eucharistia uh, without uh, even eating and drinking we need it for eternal life uh, to glorify God so we can serve the Lord and this actually will endure to it for blessing بسم الله والابن والروح القدس الإله الواحد أمين Let us read some verses from 
First Corinthians chapter two. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, grace of God the Father, be with all of us. St. Paul actually, when uh, he went to Athens, Athens is part, sorry, went, went to Corinth. Corinth is part of Greece. And Greece actually is known by the philosophers. So as he said in verse 3, he was in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. How he can address these people who are very, very uh, excellent in philosophy, and they have the excellence of speech, the persuasive words of the human wisdom. But the Holy Spirit actually uh, he taught him that you should not rely on the persuasive words of human wisdom, but you need to rely on the heavenly wisdom. But how he can preach to the people who actually very, very wise according to the human standard, how he can tell them that Christ died on the cross? God became man and this man died, and on the third day he rose from the dead. Are they going to believe this? Uh, St. Paul said, I had two options. Either one option, to hide the Christ, to hide the, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to give them Christianity as a set of morals. Because the morals that the Lord Jesus Christ taught, very, very high morals. But 
if I hired the cross, then how these people will be saved? Christianity is not just a set of morals. But if you speak about Christ, people according to the human wisdom, they will not accept that God crucified and died on the cross. That's why in, first, in chapter 1, verse 15, he said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words. Because if he used the human wisdom of words, then he will hide the cross. And thus, the cross of Christ should be made of no effect, as if all the crucifixion has no value. But actually, it is the cross, the, the crucifixion of our Lord, that is essential for our salvation. That's why he said the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They will stumble on the message of the cross. But God actually used the cross as he said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Which means you cannot understand the mysteries of God through human wisdom. It's only the Holy Spirit that's abiding in you. You can actually understand the mysteries of Christ, as he explained in chapter 2, and this is what I'm going to explain in a few minutes. But if you are going to use the logic and uh, the human wisdom, you will stumble. That's why nowadays, now many people say the Bible is inaccurate. There is infallibility, there is, the Bible is fallible. Why? Because they are using human wisdom. They criticize the, human, the, the Holy Scripture not by the Spirit of God, not guided by the Spirit of God, but according to the standards of the human wisdom. That's why he said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Then God is, uh, through St. Paul, is challenging us. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Can any of them, relying on the philosophy of the world, understand the, the mystery of God? No, they cannot. They will stumble. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Because through the wisdom of the world, no one can understand the mysteries of God. They will stumble. For since the wisdom, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom, human wisdom, did not know God. What is the problem of the atheist? They are trying to prove the existence of God through human wisdom. That's why they did not know God. So it pleased God through the foolishness of the message. What does it mean foolish message? When you tell them God became man and died on the cross, that's a foolish message to people who rely on human wisdom. Through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The Jews request a sign. In order to see to say Jesus is the Messiah, they need a miracle, a sign. And Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, that's why they crucified him. And to the Greeks foolishness. And anyone until now who rely on the human wisdom, they will see many, many things in the Bible as foolishness. They will tell, uh, they will challenge, they will try to ask you and dispute with you and tell you, do you believe that all the animals enter the ark of Noah? It's foolishness to believe this. Do you believe that people built the tower of, of, or were trying to build a tower of Babylon? It's foolishness. Do you believe the story of the flood? It's foolishness. Do you believe that Adam and Eve and the serpent spoke to them? It's foolishness. That's exactly what's written here. Because they want to examine the word of God through human wisdom, not through the spirit of God, as we're going to read in chapter 2. But for us, those who are called 
both Jews and Greeks, with uh, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God, what they considered foolishness, is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. And he, then he said, look among you, how many believed in Christ? He said, see your calling, see how many among you believed in Christ. Not many ones, according to the flesh. So when he looked around them, they did not find many wines converted to Christianity. When Paul visited Arius Bahus and Paul uh, addressed them, once he spoke about the resurrection from the dead, they made fun of him. And they, they told him, when we have time, we'll call you again. So at the beginning, wise people, human wisdom, they did not believe in Christ. Not many mighty, those who trust the might and the power, the so Christ uh, weak died on the cross. Not many noble, those who trust the riches of the world, they did not convert to Christianity. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And we see how 12 apostles, very poor, not highly educated, they were to convert the whole world to Christianity. And, and God chose the real things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Then actually, and this is very important for us as Sunday school servants, how we preach relying on what? If we are, when we preach and we give our lessons. So, from uh, chapter 2, there are seven points we need actually to put in our mind and we rely on them when we prepare our lessons or when we preach uh, in Sunday school. He said, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to the testimony of God. So, you cannot preach just looking for the persuasive word of wisdom. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and power. That's number one. It's the demonstration of the spirit and of power. Meaning what? Meaning when you, you have a strong relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit actually is not quenched in you. The Holy Spirit is kindled in you, the grace of the Holy Spirit. Then actually, your words will be so powerful. Your words can transform people. Look at the Sermon of St. Peter in chapter 2 from the book of Acts. Just a regular sermon. He explained what happened on this day and he quoted some verses from the Old Testament. How this, these words were able to transform 3,000 persons. The power is not in the words, but the power in the Holy Spirit that anointed every word. The power in the Holy Spirit that was speaking on the mouth of Peter. That's why when they heard the word of God, they were pierced into their hearts. Sometimes, when you go to one of the elders in, in the monasteries, and he tell you just a few words, but these few words has power and authority over you. Although these words, you can hear it from any, any other person, but it is the, the Holy Spirit working in him. That's why when he tell you, go and pray or read the Bible, these few words pierce your heart, transform you, change you. Even if he remained silent, you will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And you feel the reference of God in this moment. And this actually 
will pierce your heart and change you. That's what St. Paul meant here by demonstration of the Spirit and power. Do you pray before preaching? Do you ask God to anoint each word with the anointment of the Holy Spirit? Do you live what you preach? Otherwise, our words will be weak. Our words will not be like arrows or sharper than two-edged arrows. Will not be like this. But when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then that's demonstration of the Spirit and power. Uh, and, and St. Paul said that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. You believe or you repent, not because I convinced you, because if I convinced you, somebody else who is intelligent, he can convince you with the opposite. Human wisdom we can dispute with each other, but if you believe in the power of God, then it will remain. Uh, and lest the people think that St. Paul is not speaking with wisdom at all, he said, However, we speak wisdom, what you consider it foolishness, it's wisdom. Among those who are mature, spiritually mature, so the spiritually mature people, and I will explain who are the spiritually mature, they understand that our words are wisdom, are wise. But those who are not spiritually mature, they will not understand. They will consider what we are saying foolishness. That's why, yes, we speak wisdom, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the ruler of this age, who are coming to nothing. Because all this wisdom will, will end to not, in nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. That's number two. The wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our, for our glory. So, second point when we preach, we need to speak about the mystery of the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God in a mystery. Meaning what? When you read the letters of St. Paul, you will find he repeated the word mystery several times. The mystery that was hidden before the ages. The mystery that was hidden before the foundation of the world, but revealed to us. What is this mystery? It is the mystery of salvation. It is the mystery of the incarnation. If you ask anybody before the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, how God would save the world, they will tell you the Messiah will come and will be earthly king and will restore the kingdom of David. All what they're going to answer just will be earthly. Nobody, no, although the, the prophecies were very clear, but nobody will tell you exactly that God will send his son to die on the cross and then to, to be risen on the third day to, to save the world. So this mystery is, was hidden, but it was revealed with the incarnation of the Son of God. And then with the descent of the Holy Spirit on the disciples, this mystery became clearer in their mind. That's why when they were preaching, if you study the book of Acts, all the preachings revolved around the cross and the resurrection. So when we say we preach the mystery, uh, the wisdom of God in a mystery, meaning if you are going to, to preach morality only, just morals, how to be humble, how to be loving, how to be tolerant, that's not Christianity. Everything actually should be taught surrounding the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how we received it in our lives through the sacraments of the church, mainly Eucharistic. If you don't, at the end, connect your children to the sacrament 
of the Eucharist, in which actually we say, I believe, I believe, I believe, this is the body that he took from our Lady St. Mary and was crucified under Pontius Pilate. If you don't connect them with the Eucharistia, then you are preaching just morality. You are not different than any other philosophy or any other religion. So the second element in our preaching that we need to preach Christ and Him crucified. As he said in verse 2, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's actually the core of, of Christianity. We cannot actually remove this from Christianity. And said, this mystery is hidden. None of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they know that that's how God will destroy the kingdom of Satan, they wouldn't do it. That's why God hid this mystery from them. Uh, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Usually, when we read this verse or remember it, we are speaking about what God prepared for us in the kingdom, uh, in the paradise of joy and kingdom of, uh, of heaven. Which is true, because in the litany for the departed, we use this to describe the glory in eternal life. But here St. Paul was speaking about, about what? About the mystery of salvation, the mystery of incarnation. I has not seen, we never saw this, that how God sent his son to the world, never happened before, the incarnation of the Son of God, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man. Nobody actually, if you, you ask the wisest person, the wisest philosopher, he would not actually predict or expect that this is the way God would save the world. But these things God prepared, the, the economy of salvation, God prepared for those who love him. The third principle in, in our preaching, you find it in verse 10, but God has revealed them, revealed the, the, the mysteries, the economy of salvation to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Number three, actually, in order to understand these mysteries so that you can preach it and teach it in Sunday school, you need to be filled with the spirit. You need to be a spiritual, mature person. Because if you are not, then you will not understand these mysteries. And that's why, why we have so many heresies, Arius, Nestorius, because all these people try to understand God with human wisdom and human philosophy. They did not try, try to submit to the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And here I want to explain something very important. See, theology and doctrines of the church is revelation from God. What God reveals to us through the Holy Spirit. It's not speculation. It's not you make a hypothesis, then you do a research to prove it right or wrong. That is, this is the scientific method. But we cannot use the scientific method to actually understand the mystery of God and the economy of God. And this is the problem of the agnostic and the atheist and people actually who are drifted from the truth. They are using scientific method to understand the economy and the mysteries of God. But the mysteries of God are revelation, revelation to those who fear God. When I walk in the fear of God and when I am filled with the Spirit, then I will understand all these things. So the third principle, I need to be filled with the Spirit in order for God to reveal to me, to reveal to me the mysteries so I can preach it to others. 
And St. Paul explained in verse 11 why I need to be filled with the Spirit. He said, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Who knows you better than your spirit? No one. In the same way, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So if the spirit of God is in me, he will explain to me things pertaining to God. That's why in the sacrament of chrismation, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Why? Why God give us the Holy Spirit? You are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit abides in you. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. That is the economy of salvation. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches. Again, don't rely on man, human wisdom in your preaching, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with the spiritual. That's a very important principle, comparing spiritual things with the spiritual. You cannot examine things pertaining to God with scientific methods. You cannot. Yes, there is no contradiction, by the way. But to understand, the, how can you, you explain the virginal uh, birth of Christ uh, by scientific method? How can you explain the uh, change of bread and wine into uh, blood, body and blood of Lord Jesus Christ by scientific method? How can you, you explain the rebirth in baptism by scientific method? You cannot. Not because they, don't co because they contradict. No, but it surpasses the scientific method. It's higher than the scientific method. That's why comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And this is actually the fourth principle. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Then St. Paul differentiated between three different uh, persons. A natural man, and a carnal man, and a spiritual man. What are the difference between the three? The carnal man led by the desires of the flesh. The natural man led by the mind. The spiritual man led by the Holy Spirit. So, the carnal man is like a baby. You know, the children, the infant, they are led by the desire of the flesh. When they want to eat, they cry. So, what leads them? Their mind did not develop yet. That's why it can do something risky. They can put their life in danger. But what leads them, what guides them? The desires of the flesh. That's why Paul, St. Paul, called the people who are carnal babes in Christ children in Christ, as we read in chapter 3. Natural man, the people, they believe and they trust their mind, not the, the divine, uh, divine wisdom. So, they judge everything by their mind. So, the serpent cannot speak. My mind does not accept this. So I say, it's mythology, it's not true. My mind cannot accept the story of the flood. I would say it's mythology, etc., etc. The natural, that's the natural man. But the spiritual man, led by the Holy Spirit, comparing spiritual things with spirit. That's why in verse 14 he said, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. That's what people deny Eucharist. People deny uh, the incarnation of the Son of God. People deny the divinity of Christ. People deny even the existence of Christ. People consider the Bible is, is fallible. It's foolishness because they are natural. They trust their minds. They don't examine spiritual things with the spiritual. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually disturbed. Things pertaining to God only 
spiritually discerned. You understand them only by the Spirit of God. They are spiritually discerned. But the, who is spiritual judges all things. Do you remember when I told you, St. Paul said, uh, we speak we speak wisdom among those who are mature and I told you mature means spiritually mature mature here in verse 6 referring to people who are not natural who are not carnal but they are spiritual they are spiritual that's why he said but he who is spiritual judges all things all things on earth and also things pertaining to God yet he himself is rightly judged by no one because the natural people they will not be able to judge a spiritual man sometimes they criticize the spiritual people and saints as out of their mind because again they don't understand things pertaining to them many people make fun of the stories of the saints and they say why he fasted that long why did he do this it's foolishness can you believe this? You know, and people who are natural like their comments, unlike what they publish, and they say, yes, wow, that's right. But they don't know both of them because they are natural. They don't understand things pertaining to God. They are trying to judge spiritual people by their mind. They cannot. As St. Paul said, yet he himself, the spiritual man, he himself is rightly judged by no one. And they make fun of the saints because they they are not they are natural they are not spiritual that's why they make fun of them of the saints for who has known the mind of the lord that he may instruct him but we have the mind of christ when we are filled with the spirit then we will have the mind of christ and we can understand the spiritual things and this would be Number five, the fifth element in our preach, to have the mind of Christ. To acquire the mind of Christ, the word of God, besides you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the word of God should dwell richly in you. So you will think like Christ. You will see things from Christ's eye. So when you make judgment, you, you make judgment like Christ, because Christ is in you, and your mind is the mind of Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So, uh, so far we said demonstration of spirit and wisdom, uh, the uh, wisdom of God in a mystery, the revelation of God by the Holy Spirit, uh, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, we have the mind of Christ. Uh, number six, six point. Here, Saint Paul in chapter three said, "And I, brethren, could not speak to you as a spiritual, but as carnal, as babes in Christ." Do you remember when I told you carnal? They are led by the desires of the flesh. That's why Saint Paul called them babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. Many people actually abuse and oh, sorry, not abuse, misuse these verses. Misuse these verses. And they said, St. Paul said, I fed you with milk and with solid food. Why you give us this heavy material? Why preserve and curriculum is so heavy like this? St. Paul said, I fed you with milk. He was rebuking them. He told them, you don't understand. You still babes in Christ. That's why I could not give you solid food. Because solid food are for those who are mature. <laughs> Can you feed your baby until he is 20 with milk only? He will never grow up. So, St. Paul here was rebuking them, I feed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. In Hebrews chapter 5, he told them, by now you should be teachers, but unfortunately, you need to teach you the beginning of the oracles of God, because you are still carnal not spiritual that's why you are lacking discernment you cannot discern between what's good and what's evil that's why he said do you know why i'm saying you are carnal for where there are endless strife and divisions among you are you not carnal 
and behaving like mere men, they are karma. If there is division and fights and strife and envy among you, then in, in Corinth, people were divided into four groups Paul, Apollos, Peter, and Christ. People who are saying we follow Christ, they are not better than the rest because they are the nine Paul and, and Peter and Paul. Sometimes I think about this group like the non denomination when they say, or not Orthodox or Catholic or Protestant or non denomination, we accept everybody. But St. Paul did not praise them. And the fifth principle in your teaching and preaching, you should know that we are nothing. All glory to God, as he said in verse 6, I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. That's the fifth principle, uh, or the sixth, number six, actually. Sixth principle. Uh, God is the one, actually, who makes the plants grow. It's not the farmer. It's not the one who plants. It's not the one who uh, waters. But it's God. In the same way, you do something. Servant, before you in the last year, did something else. You should not give credit to yourself. All glory and all credit should go to God. If you still give credit to yourself, then you are karma. Because once I give credit to myself and you give credit to yourself, and then we'll fight with each other, we are kinder. Kind of. But the spiritual servant knows that all glory and all credit goes back to God. That's why he said, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. That's the last principle. Your labor has a reward. But what's your labor? The foundation is already laid, and no one can put other foundation than the one that's laid, Jesus Christ the foundation. But on this foundation, you can build gold, silver, or uh, precious stone. Some people will build hay, or wood, or straw. Then our life is full of tribulation. When tribulations comes, your work as a servant will appear. Tribulations are like fire. So if your work is destroyed, when there is, a, for example, persecution, or the daily tribulation, and people start to drift away, then what you built was maybe hay or wood. But if actually, they endured the fire of tribulation, then what you build is like gold or silver or precious stone. And each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are God's workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. And this was the seventh principle. We are Sunday school servant. We should take heed how we build on this foundation. What you teach the children, what you are building, how you serve them. No other foundation can anyone lay than this which is laid Jesus Christ. He is the incarnated Son of God. He was crucified, he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven, sat at the right hand of the Father. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, the day of trouble, the day of tribulation, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Troubles, afflictions, persecutions like fire. And fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If you put gold in fire, it will be purified. If you put hay in fire, it will be destroyed. So if anyone's work 
which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. But if anyone works is burned, he will suffer loss. But what about the servant? He will not get any reward. But what about the servant? Can he be saved? St. Paul said, yes. He himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Which means, it needs from him more fight, more struggling to be saved. Fire here is not the purgatory, as our brother the Catholic uh, explained. It's not the purgatory. But as through fire means, it needs more struggle for him. Because if he is a spiritual person, from the beginning, he wouldn't build wood or hay or straw. But this means he is a carnal or a natural man. And that's what he taught his children. He taught them envy, strife, division, or he taught them to, he cast doubt in their heart about the Bible, about the scripture. That's what he built. That's why his work was burned. But his salvation he needs to work hard to be a spiritual person, to be able to discern spiritual things with the spiritual things. And there is hope that he can be saved. Then he told, don't you know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in me? So you don't have any excuse. You have the Spirit of God, so you can understand things pertaining to God. So these are the seven points that we should examine ourselves in our service ministry as Sunday school servant. We need to preach with the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power of God. We need to reveal the wisdom of God in mystery. And this revelation, we receive it by the Holy Spirit. And we need to compare spiritual things with spiritual. We need to acquire the mind of Christ. We should know that he who plants or he who waters are nothing, who are just few workers with God. But God, to him, is a glory. is the one who gives the gifts and increase. And we need to watch carefully how we build on it. Are we built in gold, silver, precious stone, or wood, hay, and straw? I hope that these seven points will be clear in our mind and we rely on the wisdom of God, not on the human wisdom. Because nowadays, many things in the church are judged and examined through human wisdom, not through the wisdom of God. We need to acquire the wisdom of God. And you have the Holy Spirit abiding in you, so that actually what you are building will endure the day of fire. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.